I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet, I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? What could be more alien to the universal aspirations of our peoples than war and the threat of war? Welcome to ThoughtSpeak, a podcast dedicated to the discussion and review of K.A. Applegate's 1996 book series, The Animorphs. My name is Mitchell. And I'm Coleman. And today we are coming back at you with another episode. Uh, this is book number 42, The Journey. And it's starting to feel like quite the journey here. Uh, it feels like we're coming to the end of this journey, almost. Oh, well, well, <laughs> Not with this book. Um, this this book signaled anything but the end of the series. This was a uh, this was a, a straight up detour into Saturday morning cartoon territory. I feel this like. book this book is like uh, walking through a really long tunnel and you can see the light at the end of it, and then a homeless man grabs you and drags you back a little bit. <laughs> um, it's very similar to that. Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean. I mean. Coming from what we've read and, and going forward here, I, I think we have more to look forward to. But this is just, this is a little pit stop on the way to to some better stuff, I think. But uh, I, I I I I don't want to get too far into the book reading yet. But I I feel like this is a necessary book for the series. I'd never read this book before, but I, it's it's funny to me how the concept is like so kitschy and like uh, any sci fi series should have a book like this book. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely uh, feeling like it's parodying quite a few things and, and that they've hit the bottom of the sci-fi cliche barrel, so to speak, <laughs> to be to be pulling from this. I used to have, when I was a little, little tyke, uh, like a Ninja Turtles uh, book um, that, that was called The Incredible Shrinking Turtles, and it was kind of this similar <laughs> plot where the, the Ninja Turtles got shrunk, and they didn't... It didn't go inside anybody's body, I don't think. But uh, um, anyway, it's kind of reminded me of that. I wish I had that book. Hashtag, well, I, I, mean, hashtag I want that book again. <laughs> well, just just uh, the Magic School Bus uh, episode. That was my introduction to it. That and the uh, Journey to the Center of the Body uh, ride at Epcot uh, as I grew up. That was that was always uh, super special. And, and Inner Space, that's, that's also a classic 80s hit. They shrink down and they're dodging blood cells and just good times. <laughs> yes, yes, we could go through a laundry list of various movie references of all the shrinking things, but uh, I mean, I mean that that'd take a while. And uh, I hope to, I just, I hope that this is the last Helmicron book. I'm pretty sure this is the last appearance of them. If the characters have it their way, it'll be the last appearance. I don't of them. know. I don't know if I want them to focus on the Hell and Crowns or not, because I feel like this book couldn't decide on what it wanted to do. And it's like, it could the Hell and be interesting if it really delved into the Hell and culture and all that? Uh, or, or would I rather a book just touch on them and, and move completely the opposite direction? I don't even know which one this book did. But before we get into all that, we should definitely take a stop, uh, take a moment to thank our Patreon uh, subscribers. Yeah, like we always do. That's right. Uh, so I guess I'm going to read that list, huh? Mm-hmm. I don't have it up. You're, yeah, and you haven't spent so much time and, and effort to committing these people's uh, names to memory, you know, the way I have. And I'm going to pull that out of my memory ranks right here and now. So I mean, I, I could pull it out. I just don't want to embarrass you. Without further ado... Our Patreon subscribers, very important people. We always thank them, and here we go with that. Uh, thank you. Monica Hung, John Maz, uh, <laughs> Tomb Juice. <laughs> I think it might be a new one. Noah Troutman, Amanda Mimic, uh, Jeremy Baxter, uh, Canicula. I hope I'm saying that right. <laughs> Josh <laughs> Blount, Tony Pazak, Kendra, Ben Freeman, Jason Thompson, James Miola, Jennifer Baker... Kelly Brown, uh, Kevin Koslowski, I did it, Andrew Walker, David C., Graith, Daniel Martinoli, Tim Aheen, Nita Labrada, Gaffaro, uh, Sorrent Joyce, Michael Blemick, Peter Scholl, and our good friend uh, Stephen Steve Adams. 
Uh, wow. All these people definitely, definitely keeping the show alive and well. Um, and we invite you to come join us, you know, at the uh, ThoughtSpeak Patreon. Patreon is incredibly important what we do. It, it helps us, uh, you know, pay for the cost of the podcast, which, you know, they stack up. You got you got quite a bit going on, and, and we try to put out a good podcast and have the audio up to a certain production level for you guys. And um, just keeping the podcast alive and making sure that we keep doing this and, and try to stay on more of a schedule. I mean, Patreon's super important to us for that. So I really appreciate you guys for for kicking in some and, and helping us out. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll try to get the episodes out to our Patreon subscribers a little bit earlier than most people get them. So uh, watch out for that. And uh, we've just got a lot of a lot in the works right now with uh, new ish website coming right around the corner. And yeah, uh, specifically, specifically because of our Patreon subscribers, we're building a new website right now. You know, that's that's been able to help us out with that a lot. So yeah. I think it'll look really cool, and we'll be able to do some cool things with it, and maybe build a little group on there. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Totally, probably wouldn't even be having it if not for Patreon. So <laughs> hop on over to that. All right, enough said. Now moving on to the journey, because this is going to be a journey to get through this book uh, in under an hour. Um, you know, we we we're kind of acting like it's going to be a slog, um, but. I, I have a lot of things I really want to talk about with this book, so I'm excited about to talk about. Yeah, starting with the cover. Woo. Now, I don't know what it is, but I feel like the the Rachel and Cassie books I just can't take out into public with me quite as much as some of the others. Because for whatever reason, uh uh you know, kids turning into animals is just one level of weird, but when it's like girls, I feel it's it's a little bit weirder for an older man to be seen with this, you know. Well, I think the I think the girl books, Cassie and Rachel books, uh, they almost tried to make them cater more to the to the girl audience as well. I mean, you've got like a pink spine and purple numbers, and you know the front's like a rainbow, and it's like you know you could have just come up with one defining trait for the animorphs design and and i don't think it mattered whether there's a girl or boy on front as far as getting either audience yeah I, i'm not even sure what they were thinking with this uh particular cover so this is, this is the first uh and only i guess cover with rachel going elephant which seems like it came you know way late into the series considering how long she's had and used elephant morph yeah, and it's not like the elephant morph is super important to this book either. No, uh, th- this book, uh, spoilers, I guess. Wait, is... let me correct that. I don't believe any of the morphs were super important to this book. No, that's <laughs> what I was just about to say, is that nobody acquires a new morph. There, There isn't even uh, one morph that particularly, you know, solves their problems or anything like that. There's no, f- well, there's no focus morph. Um and uh, there, there's really no, you know, confrontation with the Yerks or Visor 3. No Visor 3 at all in this book. So, um, you know, it just feels different <laughs> from a lot of stories. I bet, I bet at this point in the series, Ghost Riders weren't allowed to introduce new animals, like new morphs, without, you know, heavy discussion with, with K. Applegate. Because how that's going to play into the end of the series, what morphs they have on hand, that's going to be really important here in a few books. Yeah. Um, so I bet the Ghost Riders were like, hey, just just use what they already have. We'll throw one of those on the cover. We'll go from there. Right, yeah. All it would have taken was for everybody to acquire Honey Badger, and then it's game over for Invincible. the Yerks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just, exactly. just a whole team. Even Axe gets a Honey Badger because he knows it's superior to Andalite. <laughs> no, so there's actually Honey Badgers on the Andalite homeworld. That's how resilient they are. <laughs> yeah, they're, so they're rec- already he, there. <laughs> he recognizes it immediately. Uh, the Yerks. Oh, that's a that's a Dell Ofstrin. The the Yerks uh, Council of Thirteen is actually just thirteen honey badgers. <laughs> that are like super ancient alien ones. Yeah. No, it's like it's it's like twelve honey badgers and one surly Wolverine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we talked a little bit about the cover. Rachel going elephant. Um, Rachel is about to go where no human has gone before. Technically true. And, I guess. and also a little bit about the, the plot, kind of. Uh, moving inside, though, I, I always thought the description of the Helmicrons is so weird. 
And I, for whatever reason, can't imagine them wearing like boots, like human boots, you know? Oh, no. They, they talk like they, every picture we have of Helmicrods, they're wearing like Star Trek uniforms. I know. They're in so little always goofy picked, little jumpsuits. Yeah. yeah. I've always pictured them with like big black boots and everything. So yeah, and I mean they're they're small even considered to them. So this this picture is kind of cool. Is it misleading? I don't remember Tobias it, going Hork Bajir. Yeah, no, he goes Hork Bajir. I was waiting for it. He goes Hork Bajir at one point because because Jake told him to watch out for his uh, spikes and stuff. Um, so okay. he definitely goes Hork Bajir. I feel like this is misleading because of the way they're described size wise in this book. And it's actually the biggest problem I have with this book is the inconsistency on what size they are versus the Helmicrons versus the body that they're in. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. It, it and just it really fluctuates. It as really needed. Yeah, it really messes up the story in multiple occasions. Sure. Because um, at one point they're small enough to go through like a blood cell or something. And uh, yeah. Well, that and then and then in this picture, they can't do anything. They're so small. But Rachel says she comes up to a Helmicron's uh, shin. Yeah, yeah, they should be morph. about the size of, like, little dogs, I guess. So it's, yeah. It's be- before we confuse our audience even more, for those who haven't read this uh, one or know what we're talking about at the moment, I'm going to go ahead and fly through the back description here, if that's okay with you. Go for it. Sometimes your worst problems are the ones you can't actually see, like the Helmicrons. These less than an inch high aliens are back. And they want the morphing cube more than ever. Obviously, Rachel, the other Animorphs and Axe, can't let them take the cube. But when Rachel tries to stop the Helmicrons from stealing it, Marco gets in the way and ends up with tiny aliens, well, up his nose. Rachel and the others can't let the Helmicrons stay inside Marco's head. They're armed and could cause serious damage. So the Animorphs and Axe come up with a plan to evict the Helmicrons from their new residence. But it involves a shrinking ray and the obvious, Marco's nose. Oh, what kind of wacky adventures could they get up to in there? It, yeah, yeah, that's, that says it all, I guess. Animorphs, uh, and, and your, uh, magic school bus was a very apt description um, so that's, that's what you're in store for folks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Buckle up buckaroos. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's a, it could have, I'm trying to think if in the hands of Applegate herself or someone else, if this could have been done better. I mean, I'm sure. Cause it's honestly reading through it. The, the writing isn't bad necessarily. There's some good lines and some good moments and stuff. Um, so it's not really the necessary of the writing. It's just, and the concept is cool. This dual uh, Marco having to be like an animorph without his powers. He can't morph or he might kill them all. So like him just trying to break into this kid's room and there's elements of like the David story there that they don't go into. Oh yeah. Uh, kind of sort of. I, yeah. They, they definitely had an interesting setup, but I'm starting to feel the more of these I read, I have this nagging voice in the back of my head going, I wish they could have made this into a Megamorph so it was longer and they had, you know, more to expand upon and deal with. Um, But the plot of this one very much felt like uh, some kind of setup and then like a plot was aborted somewhere. Um, Right away, you know, when a book starts out with a team in the middle of like a big battle going on and things are starting to get dicey and they got to bail out. Um, Typically that seems like that's a pretty good start, right? That's a lot of, a lot of these books have started out that way so far. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was even pretty interesting when they're out in the alley afterwards and suddenly like, Oh no, somebody with the cameras snaps some photos of them. Maybe, you know, mid morph or something. Um, That's, that's a pretty cool setup. Right there. That's that's an okay one. They kind of, you know, try and follow him back. They locate the person, but, you know, he's, he's in a bad part of town and in an apartment building five stories up or whatever. And it's just like they can't get the camera then and there, but they know where they are. They're going to go back to Cassie's and, like, brainstorm about it. Right? Yeah. Up to there. Pretty pretty solid setup. I'm like, okay, where's this going? Like, is this person going to develop the pictures and then, like... Uh, try to sell them to tabloids and then like they got to track them down that way. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we really needed to know more about this person. Like it didn't need to be a whole David situation, but 
there's this person who who in a back alley late at night takes a picture of them mid morph, which is fantastical. That's hey, my my worldview just changed seeing this. Uh, and then they go home and they leave their you know camera <laughs> on their desk yeah. for like three days, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, there, there is almost no, uh, characterization for this, this, you know, uh, I, I don't even want to say like a MacGuffin kind of person, but he's just really there to spur this little B plot along. Um, and there's, there's nothing given there, like you said. Um, and you know, the team's in the, in the Cassie's barn brainstorming and it all seems like it's going well. And then literally the helmet crowns just drive into the scene in a little toy car. And you're like, oh, God, I forgot it was this. Because oh. they're back. Yeah, they're, they're, just they're annoying. Plunging, plunging disappointment at the reveal of the helmet crowns of this book. <laughs> exactly. Well, they totally ramrod their way into the story and derail what could have been an interesting plot. That's just how I feel about it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, you know probably the way that we're meant to feel about these these characters because that's their archetype is just like annoying nuisance just while we're just before we get into it because i don't think we'll really need to talk about them throughout the rest of the book can we talk about real quick how just useless and pointless the chi are in this book yeah um there's like one cooler kind of moment i guess um when Marco's going back to check on the uh, apartment and one of the chi is like hanging out disguised as a homeless dude um, well, I thought that like, that's almost specifically what I'm talking about. Like, there's one point where he literally is like, oh, I'm going to get this chi guy to help me. And he's like, nah, I won't bother him. He, yeah. he probably wouldn't be able to help me anyway. I know. I, I like, think they, they give up a there. little too early on them, for sure. The chi could be used more effectively, at least in this what story. Been, what would have been cool is if, especially with uh, the reveal in this book at the end, if uh, Marco in the state that he's in, if he was wildly trying to get this camera uh you know back and the chi had like their own operation going on the whole time to get it back like and he was and they were just like this is already taken care of and it just sets marco off even more or there would have been a clash there or something oh that could have been really interesting yeah yeah uh maybe yeah for a b plot something about marco can't morph so he gets himself into a bad situation Seems like there's going to be, you know, no solution for him. And then oh. the Chi show up and deus ex, ma- ex machina him out of there. No, no, no. How cool would it have been if you had gone through this book and you have the you have the change of view where it goes from Rachel to Marco. Uh, and that's like kind of a big deal for this book, which I like. I love any time they add in multiple viewpoints. It would have been awesome if you've been going through this whole story. And then when Marco kind of quote unquote loses control if he had been even worse off for wear it would have been awesome if he had switched over to like eric and him trying to get marco out of the situation without using any violence in that perspective that would have been really cool yeah and maybe uh if they could have made these things into megamorphs books <laughs> they could have included more perspectives i, like I just Eric's. want i just want a chi chronicles that's i feel like it's the biggest gap in a book that we're missing from the series, something from the cheese perspective. Yeah. Oh, that'd be so sweet. Michael Grant, uh, Catherine, I know you listen to these, uh, <laughs> every episode, please. You got so much material to pull from. Just please do a Chi Chronicles. Even if it's, if it's only like a short story, just, ah, uh, they would handle like the death of the Pimelites so well, like back in, you know, before mankind even rose up, you have the Pimelites die out and the Chi, just this lost race of robots roaming the universe. Ah, it's yeah. so good. Oh, yeah, of course. It, it'd be amazing, and, and we'll get it someday. Just keep holding out hope. Until then, we've got, we've got you know, the reviews of books like this to I mean, I'm sure there's good... I'm sure there's a good fan fiction out there about the Chi, but I want to be reading halfway through, and then Tobias shows up and his human morph naked, and... You know, you have to deal with that. Oh, somebody, speaking of uh, fan fictions, uh, somebody was posting on the uh, Animorphs subreddit recently about um, an alternate ending to the series that someone apparently wrote that is more conclusive or something that was really, really good. Really? Um, yeah, just something to throw out there. I, I didn't know if uh, he'd found it or anything. It was apparently oh. written on the internet a long time ago, and 
can't be found anymore. Huh. Well, I'm so hopefully somebody saved it. Uh, I will also put it out there. If you go to our Animorphs regularly, if you're uh, interested in that subreddit, uh, people were asking for, I guess Reddit has a new chat feature. So uh, being one of the mod of our Animorphs, I hooked our Animorphs up and established a, a regular chat. So there's like a live chat now on the sidebar. Oh, really? Just for Animorphs. Yeah. Oh, that's badass. I got to go there and uh, drop in my two cents every once in a while. Yeah, it's, it's it's getting ramped up. It depends what time of day it is, but um, but yeah, it's just kind of cool. I called it Uninet. Do you get that reference? Oh, jeez. Uh, was it something that they did in one of their books randomly? <laughs> it's from the um, Elimus Chronicles. It's his his original race. They used, they had like their own version of the internet. They used crystals, and it was called the Uninet. Ah. Uh, so I called I called the chat room the Uninet chat. Well, that's pretty clever. I'm gonna mm-hmm. I'm gonna use that when I get on there. Like you guys know why it's called Uninet, right? <laughs> 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 yeah. So okay, cool. Well, look at that, people. Um, you know, at the point we're at, we're discussing, uh, it's it's where the book kind of divides in plots, and yeah, Marco. Um, and in, in what can only be described as like a Three Stooges esque maneuver, <laughs> the Helmicrons appear on scene, and and Marco and Rachel kind of go after them at the same time and bang heads, and you know, Marco gets knocked over, and this. Well, get- to be to be really fair, Rachel knocks him back. Oh sure, like it's not just a they plug into each other. Like Rachel, it's her fault. It felt forced, is is how it felt. I guess it definitely was. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so because of this stupidity, you know, said plot of book happens, uh, Almacron's up Marco's nose teams got to shrink himself. You know, they, they just, uh, they debated a little bit, obviously before Marco wakes mm-hmm. up, which is good, <laughs> which they should have debated it more. Like, I mean, if, if you've seen, they even reference like fantastic voyage and stuff. Uh, all of those movies have terrible sci-fi in them as far as, like, the science is involved. Like, there's no point, even with morphing powers, that you would survive well in the human body. No, I know. I, and it, what I was wondering the whole time is, like, they're not even going to put on, like, special suits or... <laughs> yeah, the first, the first, the first half, they, they come up with an explanation once they're sharks. But the entire time that they're humans... Or animals within Marco, they should have just suffocated like in seconds. Yeah, it would it would have made of no sense. Um, yeah, you're, you're very right about that. This was not intended uh, to be following any sort of rules or logic, um, which sucks because Animorphs is usually pretty good about being that kind of like down to earth sci fi for the most part. Obviously, some get books get pretty wacky, but when they're like you know, in some warehouse fighting or whatever. That's why it's pretty realistic science fiction. Yeah. And you know, that's why, uh, even when I first read this, uh, I thought, okay, they're going to shrink down and go inside Marco. You know, are they going to go in the Helmocron ship and that's how they traverse inside Marco? Or are they going to be given special suits or a special morph that can uh, move inside the human body? No, you know what this they, book, they kick you know, logic to the curb. You know what this book would have been if Kay Applegate would have written it? The Incredible Shrinking Turtles. No, it would have been the Helmicrons <laughs> finding a way to shrink smaller than they already are and using that to get into Marco's body. And then the Animorphs have to come up with a new special morph to be able to go after them. And they all morph like viruses and single celled organisms. <laughs> and that would have been Kay Applegate's way of like doing a science class on how our body cell system works. Okay, but here's the thing, though. Uh, given, you know, what we've seen of morphing technology so far, I think that morphing a single cell organism and going down that small, pushing that much of your mass out into Z-space would, in fact, do like what it did with the uh, the mosquito morph that time and and they'll just end up, you know, on the other side of Z space again. 
Um, yeah. So it would definitely, true. definitely test the limits of their morph no, capabilities. No, see, no, you, you gotta, you just gotta have one thing of Axe being like, well, I've been thinking about it since we morphed those mosquitoes, and I've actually come up with a way for us to blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah, okay, they could do that. Or, yeah. or they could be like, this is how hardcore we have to be with our morphing ability. Like, we have to be able to reduce ourselves down to a single cell organism and hold it together without, you know, snapping yeah. our mass off into Z space. Like, it'd be but like. That's how, that's how the series started, though, too, is, is each book, it wasn't necessarily K. Applegate trying to write some crazy sci fi book. She wanted to teach kids on how, like, what it felt like to be an eagle and, like, what their senses were like and how they saw the world. Like, that's what this book could have been with, like, the body and, like, cells and stuff. I think that would have fit really well into, like, the mission statement of this book series. You know, and I guess just reading about that plot, I guess I thought that there would be a little bit more of that, like, science involved. And, of course, we've got Cassie, um, who's always the brain of the group and kind of, like, narrating things. Just so, you know, the reader and the team knows what's going on at any given moment. She's the one who's always like, and there's the liver and hey. now we're going to the bowels. And In Megamorphs 2, <laughs> Tobias took over that role because he was a dinosaur geek when he was a kid. So, oh. it's not just Cassie all the time. I, okay, I guess, yeah. They, they <laughs> each have their own strong areas, I guess. It's, uh, it's Cassie 95% of the time, and then if dinosaurs appear, Tobias takes over. <laughs> <laughs> I get yeah there you go um all right so yeah that's uh the setup here is that we've got most of the, well the whole team except for Marco trunk and uh pursuing Helmicrons inside of Marco while he himself deals with this camera plot that could have been interesting but we'll uh meander here at um what do you want to say? Well, what do you want to say well, at the start wanna, of this? I want to move on and, and just see. I think it's it is kind of interesting that the Helmicrons, you know, they they do um, take it for granted. The Helmicrons are pretty dumb and are one track mind and all that. It is funny that the Helmicrons like laid a trap for them. They're like, oh well, okay. If we go into one of their bodies, they're probably going to try to use our shrink ray against us. So we're going to set it at a lower setting. Like that. That's kind of funny. Oh yeah, I you know. I guess I, I also it makes the Helmicrons more of a threat. I don't know. I it seemed like very coincidental or something. I can't give them too much credit for that, but uh, I don't know. I, I can see that the Helmicrons even like so they they had to basically take the morphine power away from them. The first Helmicron book, right? How did they keep them from morphing and killing them in the first book? Well, they didn't really because Cassie turned into a anteater at the end and, and got them that way well no as, as a full-size person but when the animorphs who were shrunk down why were the helmicrons a threat because they, the they had a morph? ship they had a spaceship that they were shooting shit with <laughs> oh no what it was is most of the animals they had when they tried to morph didn't they go even smaller and they were afraid of going that small yes that too was an issue okay because they're like, oh, if you go, you know, your baldy or your golden eagle, more if you're still going to be the size of a house fly. Yeah. So that's kind of what kept them from morphing this time. So they had to give them another uh, weakness in this book, and that was making them smaller. Yeah, sure. Although I will say they they try to give them these like hindrances, but um, they they end up you know doing it anyway. <laughs> so. Well, yeah, our heroes save the day. I mean, that's not. Well, sure, crazy, sure. <laughs> Smash through your limits, plus ultra. Um, so at the start of Act Two here, they're they're kind of having some difficulties trying to figure out how to even get you know like into Marco's body. Um, he has a little bit of difficulty locating them. You know, he's got to kind of shoo a beetle away from him. Um, he, he gets him on a piece of straw and sticks him up into his nose. That seems kind of funny because he says he stands around for like five minutes with a straw in his. Noah's just yeah. sort of chilling in the barn. We get our first and, you know, switch they perspective. Well, yeah, yeah once, once they're in there. Because um, th they can't communicate, which there's got to be some accurate science there. Um, once they're so small, you know, the sound waves from a, a normal person's voice is like, I guess, you know, too big of sound waves to be interpreted by ears that small. 
Yeah. Yeah. That, and and the right. um, the uh, they can still thought speak with him. That's that's one of his frustrations in this book is he, it, they only thought speak with him when they want to tell him not to shove something up his nose or eat anything or yeah, and it's just Tobias and Axe, two people that probably wouldn't, you know, talk to him or correspond with him much anyway. Yeah. So so anyway, so the, the crew is up his nose. He's uh, just standing around the bar, not really knowing what to do. And I guess they wanted him to stay there. That would have been the best case scenario for them is him just lay on a hay barrel and uh, like fall out. asleep or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that would have been ideal. But, you know, he, he says himself like, I, I can't I can't sit here knowing all this is going on inside me without like a distraction or something to keep me, which luckily I have because I got to get this camera thing. Um. Yeah, I I I think that's pretty. I think he's pretty blasé about the status of his friends in his own body uh, by going on this mission by himself. Yeah, but at the same time, he like I guess he feels like he needs something to do. It is pretty um, funny though how he immediately switches over to like the mentality like yeah I can I can break and enter I guess I can do this <laughs> I can up my uh, they- criminal activity career. Well, I mean, what's the difference between him doing it as a muskrat versus doing it as a human? I mean, that's they would have done it either way. No, exactly. He's at the point in his uh, uh, this story, his mental state, that you know he sees it as just necessary for his survival at this point. Well, yeah, it's I wouldn't even think he's, what he does. Yeah, what he did isn't wrong. I mean, it's it's this kid. If he's not a controller, he's going to reveal the secret of human controllers, which is. Uh, detrimental to the war effort, which could lead to the extinction of humanity. That's that's a pretty easy morality choice. Well, yeah, when you put it that way, it sounds real bad. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, where was I going with this? He caught me off guard because I was looking through the book. I have things. I have pages. Book uh, oh. dog-eared here. I have. Do you have, I have one pages? dog-eared. I have. I have one dog-eared page. Is it later on or is it now? It's later on. Oh, well, that's... But if you need me to continue um, the story while you look, I can do that. Um, no, I got this part that I might as well read now because I'm looking at it. Um, it's Marco talking about, you know, when he's going back to check out this place. The, I dropped my bike against the wall of an adjacent building, crumpled and abandoned, spoke quietly to the filthy homeless man, a chi, who was watching the front door of the building, made my way around the back. Um... That that was just the one instance I thought of, like, oh, hey, they made a good use of a chi there, I guess. No, it's cool. It's a cool concept that they got the chi hiding in plain sight and stuff, um, watching this kid. Uh, the chi don't seem to relate any information to Marco. I feel like that's what it really needed was um, if they've got chi on guard and stuff, they needed someone to be bringing updates to Marco throughout the yeah. book, which would be cool if he was just walking around and then some, like, dustpan and broom started talking to him be like hey the kid's on the move (laughs) yes that would be cool and you're absolutely right is that that's totally what this book was missing one paragraph where a cheese says hey the man that has the photos of you his name is clarence johnson and he you know is a janitor at the building down the street and he hasn't looked at the camera yet, but he plans on. I, I have his. I've hacked into his itinerary, and he's <laughs> going to do it on Tuesday or whatever. Like, well, just that little bit of info. Here's here's where I think the writer kind of messed up. Is you have two things that it feels like they care about: the inner space journey uh, throughout the human body, and the big twist at the end. Um, how they yeah. got to that with the B plot, it doesn't seem like they cared about too much, as long as they put Marco in the room with the dog at some point. No, yeah, and that's another thing that I, I totally wanted to uh, talk about or bring up as well is the uh, the pit bull shaming this book goes through or perpetuates that really came out of the '90s. I feel like uh, uh, where you know these these breeds are labeled as aggressive, but uh, it, it's been totally pretty are. pretty proven that no, nah, it, it highly depends on the owner, which is why I was hoping so much to see a little bit of characterization from this owner. What about him? Is he an abusive kind of person that would lead to a dog being aggressive or having I've, rabies? I've seen, 
There's I've so much the information study. we didn't get. Look, look, look. I've seen the same studies, and I, I don't want to get into it on this podcast, but there are dog breeds that are more susceptible to a um, aggressive or uh, more territorial or reactionary um uh, personality whether you know the owner can definitely exasperate that and make it worse but there are breeds that are more territorial than other breeds there's no i don't know why anyone still argues about that they're so worried about i see every commercial with pit bulls trying to make them seem like super cuddly dogs and a lot of times they absolutely can be but they are also territorial just like i have a shepherd a shepherd is a more territorial dog and more reactionary um it's just it's just it's not it's instinctually built into them i don't think it's as bad as people like you said shaming them in the 90s like this is trying to do like a pit bull is a scary dog but a pit bull can be a super scary dog it's a super strong dog that can be more aggressive than other dogs sometimes i don't think that's a bad thing you just have to be aware of it if you're an owner um anyway but no. in this in this specific whoa, thing, whoa. Though, what? no you said your piece i want to say mine okay uh uh because I feel like, you know, it can be done effectively, certainly. And and my only problem with it is that when they were typing this up, they thought, I, he's got to have a scary looking dog, whatever, well, let's go pit bull. You know, just be a little bit more creative. Go, go Alaskan Malamute. You know, those are giant scary dogs as well, basically wolves. Uh, go Great Dane, you know, be a little bit more creative, you know, it's it like one step away from going, there was a Rottweiler in the, <laughs> well, I want to talk about the rabies thing in the too. apartment. I think we can reveal that, but I think, I think a pit bull is a scary dog. Like just like take all the shaming and all the, uh, you know, questioning and talking and discussion out of it. Uh, it's a super powerful dog that because of mostly bad owners has become a scary figure, uh, to just dogs in general. So so I understand. In, in fact, I think this book, with the whole rabies reveal, it could be the writer of this book trying to say, hey, your preconceptions on pit bulls weren't what was going on, you know? Um, so maybe. maybe the if, they had like an, if they hadn't ham, hammed it up a little bit too much, yeah. Yeah, I actually it, think it, it just felt like a little that, more. That particular aspect I think he of should, the plot was fumbled. I think he should have been... He should have been a little more hurt by that kind of attack. It says that the dog goes full, uh, you know, head shake on his arm. So it could have really hurt him, uh, no matter oh, what dog yeah. it was. And, and he yeah. couldn't morph out of it at that moment anyway. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I want to talk about the rabies thing real quick, too. This is, a, I think, a really a big mistake of the book in the sense that you get this dog reacting to its owners. It's still obviously a part of the household. Uh, a dog with rabies is done. It's it's once it starts, the effects start coming on. Um, it's it's completely non-responsive to commands or anything. Um, so I mean, it goes full Cujo. So I don't think this dog would have still been happily looking at its owners uh, at the end scene. If oh, it had okay. The whole time. You know, you're you're entirely right there. I think the reason they left all this vague was because uh, for that reveal, um, because otherwise it turns into a completely different story. You know, uh, if you go into what this guy's got to do now with his dog, his poor dog. And- well, I just mean like I I don't think they could have revealed to. Um, I think it would have been too much to reveal to Marco that he has rabies if if the dog would have been foaming at the mouth or whatever. But a dog right. wouldn't be acting normal at the end. If it already had rabies for a day or two. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, I just thought this uh, scene in general was pretty gruesome. You know, he, he beating this dog with a baseball bat. No, it makes sure to say <laughs> that he just got his attention. He didn't hurt it. No, no, I know. They, they, <laughs> they definitely uh, uh, kidify it up by uh, yeah. making sure it's a wussy shot. No blood was drawn. Um, <laughs> to its hind quarters, and I guess we could mention that the uh, the, the shrunken team is dealing with the Helmicrons inside uh, Marco's snot encrusted nose, and um, you know they 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 get stuck in it a little bit. Marco sneezes, which expels some of them. It's kind of dangerous. Uh, yeah, know. they lose they lose like two Helmicrons just in the nose. Right. Um, the whole the whole time you're watching their numbers dwindle, um, just like I think they did in the first book too. They were in. They all kind of died Something. off. They, thought, were, they were very... Th- remember how murder-happy they were in the first time they appeared? They, like, would randomly pull out swords and just start slaughtering each other? 
Yeah, and then the and then the they anyone killed would become the captain of their ship. See, I thought those aspects of the Helmicrons were actually really interesting, like their weird ass culture. Yeah, there was definitely a lot less of their culture now that um, their their gender differences were kind of reconciled, and it was just more like, well, now the men and women are kind of competitive amongst each other. So that's that's their shtick this time around. Yeah. See, I, well, I want to see a Helmicron book written nowadays where gender is such a discussion and stuff. You could. I wonder if there's a way to make Helmicrons interesting in the modern day. Oh, holy shit. Hashtag, I want this book. Get this. Helmicron Helmicron ship crash lands one day, and it's like a team of males, and they come to our Animorphs, and they're like, hey, we want to have sex changes. (laughs) (laughs) What? And then the whole story is about the morality involved with transgender Helmicrons. No, I I was thinking it'd be way more interesting. That that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'd be way more interesting if the Helmicrons landed back and they were their usual like males will do this and females will do this. But, but they're it... like basically fungus. <laughs> no, 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 no. They're basically fungus. You know, they're like little mushroom people. Oh, okay, so it, that's. It'd their... be really interesting if if they were introduced the idea of gender fluidity and gender not mattering and how that would affect their culture and whether they'd be like. You know, once they once they heard that gender is a spectrum that dissolves like their entire culture. Oh, uh, sure, that's an interesting take on it. I was just gonna say it'd be like Doctor Snoo- uh, Seuss's uh, "The Sneeches," but with <laughs> Helmicrons. You remember the Sneeches? I, I don't think I'm familiar with that. Oh, come on. You got to know the story of the Sneeches. Uh, some of them have stars on their bellies, and some of them don't. And then the the starred bellied ones are like superior and then a guy comes to town and sells them uh star patterns and it just gets all mixed up like is, is that which one's the superior morty, race is that where rick and morty got the the nipple people circle nipples versus cone nipples uh they fight each other not really but it's kind of like that sure yeah it's it's, it's very much dr like seuss that. dr seuss's way of talking about race yes yeah okay and and by the end of it like the the ones that had stars don't anymore and the ones that didn't do and nobody cares and it would just be super funny to see that in like <laughs> this alien gender situation with specifically their culture where it's like they're trying to establish dominance I'm su- I'm surprised we didn't get some kind of asexual species from Animorphs. That feels like I'm sure we right did at some point. I'm sure we did, didn't we? I mean, aren't they Yerks technically asexual? Because I thought one of them disperses into a cloud of three or something, or is it two of them no, explode it, together three, and make it, three? It, no, it takes th- it takes three Yerks Yerks to uh, mate. Okay, three of them explode together and make. So yeah, I guess they are one or two. One, two if they have a twin, <laughs> an evil well, twin. Well, they gotta make. It can't be three explode into make two or one the whole species would die out it's just like that spice girl song tonight when three become one Mm -hmm. i'm not as familiar with the spice girls uh (laughs) discography as you are (laughs) well they have a song called two become one okay we are so off track uh yes that means that means we're on track for maximum (laughs) entertainment uh, what are the Helmicrons doing right now? Well, they <laughs> fall down the esophagus. That's a big thing. Rachel turns. Rachel turns into her iconic, you know, front cover elephant morph, and uh, she falls off the. Oh, I guess the back of the nose. Wait, the there, there, there's with her something actually super important that uh, I thought was a huge plot hole. By the way, what the fact what? that the fact that during Marco's entire scraping incident with this dog, he never acquired it to make it go docile. Oh, yeah. He can't morph, but he totally could have acquired it. Exactly, and I was waiting for it, and it didn't happen. And I was like, oh, really? Are they just going to ignore that? Are they going to pretend I mean, like that didn't happen? Hashtag, that didn't happen? <laughs> no way. I mean, I guess it's just a lapse of his memory, that knowing he could do that, but they've been up against some dangerous animals, and that's saved their life, so it's weird that he'd forget that's that. That's like your number one technique as an animorph mm-hmm. when you're dealing with aliens or <laughs> at this point animals i i would just be ready it, like that's basically its own superpower is you have the ability yeah. to make things docile like do it <laughs> you know use that aspect of it who cares that you know you're acquiring their dna technically when you do it um 
<laughs> just like tackle the pit bull to the ground and hold it and it <laughs> yeah, do something like that. But anyway, I, they, I probably just thought... just, they probably would just made you aim more angry, and he would have tried to make it docile, and and then the writer would have been like, but Margaret didn't realize that this pit bull it didn't care about he was uh, you know. <laughs> its DNA. It, it fought through it because it's such an aggressive species. Its dying will enabled it to be reborn. <laughs> it's, it's murderous intent. Uh, it's too much for his powers. <laughs> it, it's using Nen and Haki and uh, uh, what's the one from Naruto? Chakra. <laughs> and, and Marco didn't realize that this dog only believed in two genders. And that was it. <laughs> Either way, plot hole uh, there on that, and yeah, that's uh, a pretty big pothole. The team that's inside Marco, like you said, there's so many inconsistencies. So they go up his nose, um, down the down the throat, esophagus, whatever. Um, the Helmicrons, like you know, they're they're destructive. They have Dracon beams and they're shooting it up. And the team doesn't want them. They're so powerless to like do anything to really stop them. I feel like the whole time they're just kind of following them. And then things would happen inside Marco that would take the Helmicrons out just naturally while the Animorphs kind of just withstood it. Um, mm-hmm. that's, that's definitely well, how thought, it felt. I thought the stomach was interesting. I thought this was kind of cool where uh, when Rachel falls in, it's you know it starts getting really hot and then it's burning away her skin. And she even says at one point that the, uh, the stomach acid burned her eyeballs out when she was an elephant um, and all this stuff. So they're just constantly, every time they jump into the water into the stomach acid they're losing like their eyes and their tongues and things like that and they're just morphing to heal it real quick sure it's 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 pretty gruesome it is weird though um you know they've done some some questionable morphs like morphing in water or whatever they can do that cassie morphed and rachel morphed a whole bunch inside of a yerk pool several times Mm. um so morphing in stomach acid is not really anything different. It's just that, you know, it should kill them a lot faster, especially if they're going to something with smaller mass. Uh, and again, they shouldn't be able to breathe in here. Uh, right. So especially the, the when they turn into sharks, when they turn into sharks, there's nothing for them to breathe. Well, no, not according to them is they, they can pull oxygen from the blood. Well, yeah. Through Once their they gills. get into the bloodstream, but they have to swim across the entire stomach as sharks before they get into the bloodstream. Oh, sure. And that does, it's, it's just, yeah, you're right. It, it makes no sense. There, there's no, like, it's not like they were going from dry land into a liquid within, you know, his stomach and the acids. Right. So that just, it doesn't make sense there already. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, we're not trying to review this thing as a science, human biology, anatomy manual, it's it's just we expected a little bit more realism, I think, out of this. Maybe or just yeah, you know, I mean, something a little bit more going, interesting. I don't think we're going crazy. We let things slide in animorphs all the time because um, it's interesting. And, and but most of the time, you know, some Atlantean uh, escapades aside, most of the time animorphs tries to be pretty down to earth and serious uh, with its sci-fi. Sure, so. most of the time. Uh, this is like this is yeah we're already going into act three here technically i guess this this book felt like (laughs) this book felt like not a lot happened you know like it went by quick or something it's the game of thrones effect where there was a lot of descriptions and and things like that happening and scenes were like pulled longer than they should have been yeah Um, yeah but you basically mentioned a lot of this i mean they're they're Dealing with the stomach acid, that was pretty gruesome, I guess. It's kind of almost yeah. like they don't have much else to do here. They they go further into him, um, down the bloodstream. Like, this is, as we said, they morph the sharks, which somehow works. Um, even though they, they even throw in a little bit of the whole struggling to control the, the shark instinct, because, of course, they're, like, swimming in blood, so... That would drive their shark morph mad. It would have been cooler if they just like weren't even able to control it or something. But yeah, they had to morph something else. They didn't have time to kind of mess with that. Uh, I, they make mention, of course, of of you know the possibility of being pooped out. They, they they're like, oh, there's the the weight of the colon. I I, think, I don't think they could have like they were trying hard to keep them alive with everything they already did. I don't think they could have figured out a way to have them travel the entire 
uh, intestines. Oh yeah, and, and still be and, alive. Well, exactly, exactly. It'd have been an entirely different book. We'll for that. Even if they could like breathe and stuff, I imagine the entire lower intestines would just be them like, like their eyes stinging and throwing up and just not a good time. Oh, it smells like shit everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> so they're they're gonna go to his liver. I guess that's where the Helmocrons are kind of heading. They're just sort of. And again, this whole book feels like all they're doing is just pursuing the Helmicrons as they keep going deeper. And they're even at the point where Jake is like, whatever, we'll give you the box. Just get, get out of here, you know? <laughs> Let's end this book as soon as we can. <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, and, and you know, these are our plots. This is what we're stuck with. Um, you don't really have the, the more interesting aspect of maybe the, the camera guy develops the photos and sees it and is like, whoa, holy crap. Um, none of that. Marco just kind of goes back to, uh, uh, the, the place, you know, to deal with the dog. And this is of course where he, he gets himself into the apartment and he's stuck in a tight spot and he has no oh, other but choice wait. but to morph. You missed a major plot development, uh, before this. And that's when they're in the bloodstream and Rachel sees some weird little bug, um, some weird little virus yeah. thing, uh, bounce around a- in there. That was a very cool little like description of uh, you know seeing a virus enter a body and yeah it was and, cool and I just wish it would have made sense to their size I, I think it made zero sense to how big they were supposed to be sure the 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 virus you're saying should have been even smaller well I think they they should have been microscopic to be dealing with blood cells and viruses and stuff. Oh, yeah, and they're just not at that level. Yeah, they're somewhere in the middle. you got to assume, the way they were described, they were, you know, the size of a, you know, like a booger or something. You know, that's that's not microscopic. Oh. Well, I know, they're, like, smaller than that. Well, if the Helmicrons are, like, a quarter of an inch tall, and they're a quarter of the size of the Helmicrons... It's still not microscopic. Okay, yeah, you got a point there. Yeah, none of that really matches up. So don't read into that too much. <laughs> uh, but, uh, okay, yeah, you mentioned that. They, they saw the virus. Ooh, big setup for this, this twist ending here. Um, because Marco's got to uh, morph into Roach. Now, in doing so, definitely saved his life, right? Mm-hmm. There's no question about that. Yeah, and I even like that the roach morph. It's kind of like I like how Jake has a line. It's like, "Oh, that was Marco's last joke." Is that he tried to morph something that couldn't die, and then he got killed. Oh yeah, like the hardest thing to kill. That's how he died. And sure. Um, now, are, is it safe to assume that because they'd made it, were, were they in his heart, or they were getting close to his heart, or something like that? They got into his heart, yeah. They, they go into the antechamber of his heart. Yes. That's when he morphs. And it's because a, a roach also has a heart, yeah? Yes. That that when they, you know, when he did the morph, I guess it didn't try to expel their mass or do anything like yeah. that. Because so they were is, in a pretty central spot to the mass, relative. So this is kind of interesting in my mind, is that the organs themselves try to turn into similar organs within the animals. Um, so that's kind of a hashtag morph lore addition. Um, sure. Cause why, why, you know, if you've already got a heart and your morph also has a heart, it just makes sense that that heart would turn into the Here, other heart. Here's my biggest problem with the entire book though. There is no discussion and nothing happens with the size difference of a human heart and a cockroach heart. Oh, sure. They, they do, so, uh, skip past a that. <laughs> A Helmicron is a quarter of an inch tall, okay? So they'd have busted out of the cockroach. They would have exploded. There were still three at the end. They would have exploded out of a cockroach's heart. Oh, like killing Marco. (laughs) Yeah, the alien, or the the animals themselves would have probably been too big for that heart. (laughs) Right, okay, so... And nothing changes in their environment whatsoever. Like they talk about it morphing and stuff. They don't talk about it constricting. Or no, if, if anything, or it looks like it gets bigger because they're like, oh, it yeah. became like cavernous. Like, yeah, <laughs> and there were tunnels and stuff like uh, perspective. Definitely not the strong point of this book. And let's be honest, Super. you know, if this series 
ever becomes anything more visual, a, a cartoon, a movie, a TV series, whatever, what have you, these Helmicron stories will most likely be skipped. And that's okay. No, there's ways to redo them. Oh my gosh, there's so many great 80s movies about tiny aliens that you could pull from to redo these. Well, knowing that uh, if they do this as a series or movies, a series of movies, they'll have less time to work with. These are the plots so, that will be cut <laughs> from I want to do a dramatic runtime. reading. I'd like to do dramatic reading now. Uh, this actually takes place before they get into the heart. Okay. Uh, before. Uh, but I Is it the neep neep so. stuff? <laughs> nope, no, no. So, uh, here we go. We've got to swim, Jake said. Fine, I agreed, but which way? Toward the heart, Cassie said. Which is, I asked, above the liver, Cassie said. Who said you were directionally challenged? About a dozen tunnels went up to the left and up to the right. One tunnel seemed to go straight. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, Axe said. You really have been on Earth too long, I told him. You'll never fit in on the Andalite homeworld now. I would miss Saturday morning cartoons, Axe said. Yeah. That was my favorite part of the whole book. <laughs> Them talking about Axe being too earth uh humanized uh and how he would he made it like axe actually makes a joke there about being like i would miss saturday morning cartoons if i went back yeah (laughs) (laughs) it it was one of the standout lines from this book i'll give you that uh everybody i felt like wasn't necessarily like they were off character by any means it just felt like there was less of their personalities to go around for what they're doing here i don't know if that makes sense um, no, it does. Really quick, I just want to mention, like, um, I'll, I'll read a scene, too. Why not? So I'm just starting it randomly here at the top of page 65. Respect us, Jake bellowed, or we will tell our friend to bring the wind. The Helmicrons started laughing or cheering or whatever that neep neeping was. One of them, neep, neep. One of them took the flat of his sword and knocked me off my feet. Neep, neep, neep. <laughs> okay, so uh, this, this neep thing... Definitely, to me, felt like a reference to Monty Python and the Holy Grail, the Knights Who Say Knee, because it's the same sort of gag, where it's just a random, annoying noise that characters do that, you know, is just there to frustrate and <laughs> and, and set back the, the characters that are having to deal with that. So I can see that. That's yeah. what it felt like to me, and I, I feel like uh, Michael Grant is like a big uh, uh, Monty Python fan. And uh, probably inserted that little gag. They're like, okay, these guys have to be super annoying. Let's give them this like little super annoying laugh, cheer, jeer thing that they say. Yeah, <laughs> I can totally see that. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, so, so Marker turns into a cockroach because he's trying to get away from the dog. Who's also trying to get? Uh, he's also trying to get away from whoever. And it sounded like two women entered the room. I don't really understand. No, I think that. A, a man. I think it was the man who owned the place came in with a woman. Okay. Anyway. Probably but, um, a vet to look at the dog. That's sick. <laughs> uh, so Marco turns cockroach to get away from the dog uh, instead of, again, trying to acquire it and making it docile or any of the other tricks he has. Um, so he goes cockroach, hoping it won't kill his friends, whatever. And uh, the everybody in the heart is just hanging on for dear life and then once it's done uh the animorphs kind of just like forget the situation the helmicrons uh they're still alive totally fine and they just blast uh marco's heart and they kill marco so (laughs) yeah it's it's a very weird turn of events here at the end where it's just like oh my god marco's dead but like jake's still making jokes (laughs) yeah but even before they know that there's hope like Jake is making jokes and trying to cheer everybody up, and it's just it's weirdly written. It's really weird. I think it it is very, uh, you could interpret it as, like, you know, Jake and everybody at this point have known all along, like, we could have died anywhere along the lines here. Sometimes we have, and <laughs> we keep coming back somehow, but they're they're, like, so prepared for death at this point that I think his reaction is very realistic for when it really happens it won't be this big like over dramatic thing it'll just kind of be like yeah you know like i knew this was gonna happen i knew it was gonna happen i gotta power through this like in in public but when i'm you know in private i'm gonna ball my eyes out or whatever like that's how but they would do it we've seen one of them die recently like as recent as the megamorphs book where they go back in time 
And even though they're ready for death, like Jake just shuts down when Marco has died before. And Cassie even goes just like numb when someone dies. And this time I thought they were too much like talk, too talkative and stuff right after this. I don't know. No, it, you're right. They definitely didn't handle it properly. It, it wasn't given enough attention. It felt like they, they were trying too hard to set up these conflicting kind of twists, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, they wanted to have their cake and eat it too, and their cake was Marco dying, and their eating it was Marco having rabies, and <laughs> I couldn't split the difference. Uh, yeah. So so anyway, they come up with this. Uh, you know, they're talking about roaches being impossible to kill, and that jogs Cassie's memory for hey, roaches actually are impossible to kill. Like their heart, they can live without their heart and stuff. So them just and this this is I think kind of lazy on the writer point they they're all just yelling different things at marco and and uh rachel's like i don't know what it was axe counting down uh jake making jokes cassie just desperately pleading with him to come back but oh man he he pulled it off like they don't even show it or describe it they're just like yep he came back no exactly and then furthermore they're like and then he even morphed seagull and like flew him all out of there <laughs> like yeah it's totally like, like make sure a, to get a, make sure to get the camera a one paragraph turnaround where he's like and he came back to life, he morphed out, he grabbed the camera, yeah. he got the team out, it all happened in the span of one sentence. <laughs> and the dog's gone, the people are gone. Yeah, yeah, they don't have to deal with, that subplot is totally done now. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your, your time spent with us today, folks. Because <laughs> we've got one wrap-up chapter here with the big twist coming up. Yeah, with Rachel uh, late-night Googling. Um, she, she just really wants to figure out what that virus is. And she, it's revealed that, uh, oh, it was the rabies virus. So if he hadn't, uh, uh, that's, he didn't betray his friends or care about not, I actually think this could have been done well. And they, they almost did it in kind of an interesting way. Yeah. If they had drawn out the symptoms, maybe a little bit more or something. If they had cared about the B plot, if they, if Marco, his state of like, ah, I think what these books are good at is describing the state of mind of the person who's narrating. And they could have really done something interesting with a person succumbing to rabies and it, it messing with their choices. But instead, they just like, and this rage filled me that I don't know where it came from, but I'm going to go do this mission. Yeah, yeah. They they definitely uh, didn't do the symptoms uh, justice, I guess. Uh, or how good, oh, how good would it have been if they go through this whole mission and almost die in Marco, and then Marco fully succumbs to uh, the rabies virus um, and is, like, going crazy, and they've got a enraged, crazy, morph-capable person they've got to take down <laughs> at the end of the book. That'd be crazy. You know, I feel like they missed out on an opportunity, though, to put, like, on the very last page of this book, a little, you know, kind of like the more you know segment where it's like if you or someone you know has rabies contact your local animal control unit it may already be too late <laughs> oh here's okay i'm gonna rewrite the end of this book real quick can i can you go around along with me i guess give me that okay so so uh jake and cassie and rachel and all of them they get out of marco and um they think he's dead he's 100 percent dead and they hear the the uh people in the next room and the dog's still going crazy and uh, they have to leave him. They can't take his body anywhere. They don't know what to do. So they have to get out of there. Maybe they can come back for it or something. And so they start to leave, and they get around the dog, and they're almost to the window, um, still as tiny people. And then they realize, oh, wait, he might not be dead. And they start thought speaking to him. And they're like, Marco, you can morph. You still have five minutes. Blah, 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 blah. Come on. Come back. And they wait and wait. And then the dog goes quiet. And then a, a rabies foaming at the mouth gorilla bursts out of the closet. <laughs> and it's just going like crazy on the room. And the people are running and screaming and the animal. Are, and then like the chi come up and like have to like take him down without hurting him. And ah. Oh, okay. Well, I was totally going to say that uh, the, the dog then turns into Marco and he's like, ah, I was the dog the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Uh, well, then who's this gorilla? Well, well, then who's that dead cockroach we crawled out of? <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was Tom 
the whole time. I, I, that doesn't even make sense. Uh, but that's this book. That's that's the journey. That's the whole journey, and nothing but the journey. Yeah, that's the journey we went on. Really, the journey was uh, it was about the friendships we made along the way. It it truly was. Uh, did we did we wrap up the the fact that you know they managed to. Uh, unshrink themselves and send the Helmicrons packing, hopefully yeah, to never really, come back. After a book of disappointments, I was actually really disappointed with how they handled the Helmicrons at the end. They, the Helmicrons at this point are incredibly murderous, tried to kill them, really got the upper hand on them. At this point, you just take them out. Like, it's it's done. <laughs> They're worse than the Yurk because there's no redemption for them. I guess, uh, yeah, but it, it, you know that doesn't seem to be the message with them. It's not like they're they're bad for the sake of being bad. It's just kind of like it's a personality flaw of theirs, you know. And, and so it's not necessarily like even though the Helmicrons are totally like chopping with swords and shooting them up and stuff, they could kill the Animorphs, sure. Um, the Animorphs, for some reason, just you know they don't fight them the way they would fight other. Aliens. And I get it. They're there. They, they. I really like the Helmicrons' place within the universe and the idea of Animorphs. They're the crazy little aliens who come and bug them every once in a while. Like that's they're they're Kazoo, uh, in the Flintstones. No, because Kazoo that, was all powerful. He was all powerful. <laughs> but I'm saying like his place within that realm. He was this guy who came and annoyed Fred Flintstone and had a wacky adventure with him. You know, on those episodes. Sure. So that's who the Helmicrons are. And I really like them within this universe because they are actually making a lot of references to tons of different sci-fi tropes. But, um, but yeah, they're just I, I don't know why you would power their ship back up and let them go again. Because all their worries about them going to the Yurks and doing all this other stuff. That's still relevant. Still yeah, you're, yeah, you're very right about that. The, who says they're going to blast off and leave Earth? They're still apparently sticking around on Earth for whatever reason. They even said we're going to go into space and come right back. <laughs> uh, at one point it's like you can't trust them and it's empowering up their ship and and again letting these aliens who hate you uh who still have knowledge that a you're humans and b you have the morph cube um it just seems like bad news dude it would have been way cooler if the ultimate end for the helmicrons is like and i mean like they could have done this as a cool book i think is like the whole helmicron mothership lands on earth and it'd be super funny if it was the size of like you know like a model city or something like like a drone one of our our good sized drones but it's still really small for like an alien mothership and mm. and it sets down you know in like Cassie's barn or whatever and this sets up the whole big battle with their their race and then in the end I would I think it would have been super funny if they stripped the helmicrons of their shrinking technology and their spaceship and then put them in like a really small like Chinatown pet shop, you know, like like the kind where like the kind where uh, you, you'd find a magwai, <laughs> yeah, a little gizmo, like that's where they stick them in the end. Well, if they had like a, I think it'd be great. And like a terrarium. I really like your idea of like an invasion, like the Independence Day of the Animorph series, except it's Helmicron. Yeah, and it's, so it's super tiny. tiny in it. That's the joke. So they come they come with all of their forces and come down, and it's, like, barely enough to even, like, make a, you know, difference in Cassie's, like, field. Uh, yeah, it'd be funny if like, their, their mothership is, like, smaller than a car, and then they've got a bunch of, like, frisbee-sized <laughs> saucers <laughs> that are just kind of floating around that don't yeah, look intimidating. Yeah, they're, like, blowing up her, her like, uh, water pipe. And, uh, or, you know, or like, like her uh, plants. <laughs> oh, did my ficus. What, what do you knock it off? <laughs> Here's the ending for that book. And this is a book I desperately want now. Um, uh, and I want it to be told completely from the perspective of the Helmicrons. And this is the Helmicron Chronicles, uh, is their invasion on Cassie's farm. Um, <laughs> Anyway, here's how this book ends, though. They are defeated by the Animorphs. They are at their mercy and will. And uh, they end up in a terrarium, a closed-off terrarium um, yes. in the Valley of the Free hork And they, they survive the rest of the series, but they're just in, in some terrarium in the background. Or, or yeah, a terrarium in... Uh, oh, that'd be awesome if it was, like, down in the Chi, uh, their hidden park, <laughs> their hidden dog park. And it was, yeah. like, a big... Uh, glass, like, you know, uh, uh, ant farm style, <laughs> mm -hmm. except with Helmicrons all working in, like, little mines. Oh, that'd be funny. Like, okay, so they, they could have done some cool stuff, but I feel like they were just 
overall underutilized. I don't know if they're going to turn up later in the series. I don't think they are. I'm gonna here. here I'm gonna start a new uh, thoughts speak hashtag. It's a uh, hashtag save it for the sequel series. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> save yep, it for the so sequel. Yep. So uh, cool helmicron then, ideas. Yep. Put that around. Get it viral. <laughs> um, I like. Anyway, it. so yeah. Yeah, so the only other thing that happens in this book is uh, Cass, or not Cassie, but Rachel's little joke at the end of, uh, oh, Marco has rabies? I guess I'll tell him tomorrow. <laughs> like, because he's some annoying brat in this book who who really only bad things happened to him, and it was all their fault, and Rachel's fault particularly. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, I, I Well, at least they planned on telling him. I guess they could have not told him at all. They, she could have been like, <laughs> oh, well, I didn't want to tell him he might have, you know, he had rabies. It, it might have uh, just made things worse or something. I don't know. Yeah. They told him. That's the thing. Yep. Well, do so. you, want, you want to do our reviews? You want to you formally review this thing? Say a couple yeah, who, words? Who, who, who do you want to go first? Pour one out for this book. Uh, I don't know. I can go first. I mean, I'm okay with that. Okay, good. So, generally, it was okay. I mean, all around, Animorph story, okay. Like I said, it, it felt like tuning into a Saturday morning cartoon where you have your established characters, your team... Um, they're going to go on a wacky adventure, and at the end of things, everything's going to be reset back to default. Uh, nothing nothing is going to have any long-standing effect on the plot here. Don't think that that's what you're getting yourself into, because that's not the case. Even if this is the last time we see Helmicrons, they're out of the story for good, with having little effect. So, uh, you're not missing anything by skipping this one, I'll say. Uh, you know, it, it felt very different in that there wasn't really much of a conflict other than, like, Helmicrons are on the loose. Here's your plot. That's what you get. Follow some Helmicrons around for a little while, and in the end, you know, things will be okay. Uh, no Visor 3, no Yurk interaction other than the, uh, like, opening battle scene. Um, no new acquired morphs. Uh, just not a whole lot of characterization out of these characters that we've known to known and loved um i I just i can't help but i I can't say it more than enough that this thing is skippable in all regards as far as these animorph stories go you'll you'll probably have a lot better points to point out but for me i'm sorry this thing is just a one out of five uh uh i I can't even think of a good um helmicrons there there you go Annoying helmet. Use one. Use one of the genders. <laughs> uh, a non-gender specific group of helmicrons. This is this is before <laughs> well, this gonna, is before I was segregation. You, I was hoping you would say like female helmicrons or male helmicrons, and I could just use the other one. No, you know what? I dog-eared. I think uh, a term that they said that I planned on using, and because uh, they said something. Uh, you read your thing, and I'm going to scan these these things for it read my thing you mean tell me over you tell your thing i'm gonna read my thing <laughs> okay um so yeah i'm after reading this book i was like oh, okay there's a lot of things i didn't like about that but i guess it was popcorn filler animorphs uh i i think i really did like some of the concepts i thought the writing was fine for the most part as far as dialogue and things like that i don't think they're like a bad writer compared to some of the other ghost riders uh, and there's some really good lines in here even some good good aspects of it but um yeah i think uh i think talking about it now after here it's really pointed out even uh, even how how many different directions you could go with a follow-up to the helmicron story and how many cool things they could have done and it's just even more disappointing and i know you shouldn't review one single book on what it could have been instead of what it was but even what it was was pretty anger inducing while i was reading it just the size differences and the the plot holes and it's just it's just a conceptually and structurally it's a very lazy book and they could have done a lot more and i know at this in in part of the series I'm sure Kay Applegate and Michael Grant were gearing up for the end and all the cool ideas they had for the end, but it doesn't mean that this one just could be sloshed in and, and phoned in and ugh, just just not a good book. And I I don't like giving one out of fives, but this is definitely a one out of five neep neeps uh, from me. I, I ugh, 
Not a good book. I remember it. It was, I, I give this a one out of five Helmicron Hilnas. Oh, uh-huh. yeah, I remember them pointing that out. It's the only bit of Helmicron lore we got. Your your weight is not enough to bruise the Hilna of a mighty Helmicron. I had no clue what a Hilna was, so but like I wanted to pulverize of, some. Like the top of their foot, maybe, or something? I thought it was like a dirty thing, like their oh. genitals or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why they'd say that, but... I don't know. But yeah, not a, not a great book. Uh, hopefully we've gotten a good episode out of it, but... You know, this is, uh, it makes sense that we'd have to slog through a, another ghost written book before uh, we get to one that seems, I mean, I, I haven't read this one, but the next one seems pretty interesting. Yeah, you know, I can't honestly remember if I read it uh, somewhat recently, like during our college run through the series or something. I might not have read this one at all. I, I honestly don't remember the the uh, free yerk or whatever that, that kidnapped Tobias that one time. Uh, coming back, so see, I don't even know what you're talking about. So spoilers. <laughs> well, yeah, you do. We we read that yeah. book, the one where. T- oh, Tobias you mean the, is... the torture, the torture episode? Yeah, there's that yeah. one. Um, so yeah, I did read something that Tobias is a turn in this one, or he, uh, it's it, I guess it talks more about him becoming a Nothlet and whether that was an accident or not, which sounds pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Well. Uh, I mean, the Tobias books generally are really, really good. So I, I think we're we're definitely going to look forward more to it than we did this one. I know that the uh, Cassie and the Outback episode is coming up fairly quick too, and I never read Cassie that and one. The Outback? Yeah, Cass- yeah, Cassie and the Outback. Yep. Oh, and the Outback. I think it's Upback, and I was like, "What does that mean?" But the Outback Steakhouse, Coleman. Keep up. No, yeah, that's the one that people don't care for either, right? <laughs> I guess so. Uh, uh, a book where it's just Cassie doing stuff. Um, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> it's it's never been favorable for us in the past. But uh, oh, it, yeah, it was amazing in the sickness. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the sickness is really good, and also um, the one where she's with uh, the little girl Yerk. Uh, in the Lost in the Woods. That's pretty awesome. Yes, that that was moderately enjoyable as well. We have turned as a podcast. We are not anti-Cassie anymore. I think starting out, we we knew it was some easy hit points um, to throw Cassie under the bus. But. I feel like every episode we, we have to reiterate, we are not anti-Cassie here. I, I have a feeling, and this is just me thinking about the end of the series, uh, when she betrays the Animorphs, I don't think that's a spoiler for anyone. When she betrays the Animorphs, I feel like Cassie's going to become one of my favorite characters in that book. Well, so. boy howdy, I can't wait to to reach that pinnacle peak with you, my friend. Mm-hmm. I just want every character to be David. That's where I stand. Um, <laughs> that's the best of the we're, characters. We're issues. definitely going to get some some more interesting developments out of Cassie, especially with, uh, it's basically her idea to do the whole auxiliary Animorphs. So mm-hmm. it, it's, it's some good we gotta stuff. Get through, we got to get through the Outback book. We got to get through the Return of David, which I'm super excited for, but I feel like that one's probably not going to hold up on reread, mm. if I had to guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I have mixed feelings about that one, so I hopefully think, honestly, I'll feel better about it. Until we get to the end of the series, I think the Return, uh, where David comes back, is the only book I've read from here to like the third or fourth, the last books. Oh, that's nuts, dude. We yeah. got some really good stuff coming up too. So mm-hmm. all the I've more incentive. Any, I've never read anything about the auxiliary animorphs or anything about Cassie's betrayal or any of that other than what's in the countdown to the ending books. So you're able to spoil some things, but other things not. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no clue. Awesome. So. Well, yeah, like I said, come on back for episode four. Uh, well, not episode, but for our review of book number 43, The Test, starring Tobias and Axe, I assume. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, really looking forward to that. Um, again, we are on Twitter, uh, at Morphcast. We are on Facebook. Just search for Thought Speak. Um, please leave us a review on iTunes. Other than uh, subscribing to us on Patreon, uh, leaving us a review on whatever app you listen to us on or itunes or anything like that super helps out i actually listen to us on uh cast since i got an android phone 
Uh, I've been using CastBox to listen to all my podcasts, and I realize we don't have any comments on there. So if you use CastBox uh, to listen to us, I'd love to see some comments pop up on there just to uh, leave us a review score and stuff. So whatever you use, Stitcher, whatever, um, those reviews super help out the show. It just helps spread the word of the show, and anyone who wants to catch up, um, that gets them uh, more aware of us as a podcast. So it's really appreciated. And again, Patreon, super important to us. Um, anyone who subscribes helps keep the show alive and push us to get out the next episode quickly. And you get some bonuses for being a subscriber as well. So check that out whenever you can. That's right. That's patreon.com slash thought speak. And our website is thoughtspeakcast.com. Uh, might be experiencing some downtime within the next couple of weeks, months. I don't know. Uh, we, we're retooling things. We're trying to make it better. We're trying to make it more of a community. Uh, I'm noticing that uh, a lot of people are posting comments on our episodes there, and it's great, and I want to be more interactive, and uh, I, I just want it all to flow really nicely together. So uh, we're going to have some cool developments coming up in the future, uh, especially as the series winds down and we find ourselves in some really, really interesting books. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it. Um so yeah, so uh, with glove getting in here, getting back into another episode, and I, uh, you know, I'm glad we're past this book and we got this episode done. <laughs> uh, but uh, the next episode, next book looks sounds super interesting, and uh, can't wait to get to it. Absolutely, and I really hope that you listening there at home we've had some longtime fans some new people joining the cast some people just finding the podcast i'm in the process of trying to get the episodes up on uh, some sort of youtube channel for uh, a whole new group of people to find us and listen to us but please stick with us for the long journey we're almost there we're almost to the end and can't wait to reach that peak with you all uh, until then i've been your host mitchell and i've been coleman and we will see you next time folks 